Welcome everyone to this new great talk on genocides and crimes against humanity, lessons from the Nuremberg trial for the 21st century. Have we learned anything? We are delighted and honored to have with us Professor Philip Sanz, as well as the doyen of our Graces Association, our dear Yves Begbeder, who was himself at the Nuremberg trial. Both Professor Philip Sanz and Yves Begbeder are very well known, but just for the record, I would like to share some basic information about both of them. Professor Philip Sanz is a British and French lawyer at Matrix Chambers and Professor of Laws and Director of the Center of International Courts and Tribunals at University College in London. He is a specialist in international law and appears as counsel and advocate before many international courts and tribunals, including the International Court of Justice, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, the European Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights, and the International Criminal Court. Professor Sands serves on the panel of arbitrators at the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes and the Court of Arbitration for Sports. Professor Sands is the author of 17 books on international law, including Lawless World and Torture Team. His book, East West Street, on the origins of genocide and crimes against humanity, has been awarded numerous prizes, including the 2016 Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction. His latest book is The Ratline, Love, Lies, and Justice on the Trial of a Nazi Fugitive about Otto Vector. Since February 5, 2018, Professor Sanz has served as president of English Pen. In East West Street, Professor Sanz focuses on one of the most important debates to emerge in response to the Holocaust, whether the Nazi defendants at the Nuremberg trials were guilty of genocide or crimes against humanity. Sands combines a history of the evolution of these two central legal concepts for the prosecution of systematic mass murder with insightful mini biographies of those who were responsible for developing these concepts, as well as those who were practitioners or victims of the Nazis genocidal policies. Our dear Yves Begbeder has a license en droit at the Sorbonne and a master's degree in education of the Indiana University of Bloomington in the United States. He also has a doctorate d'état in public law from the University of Grenoble. He has written 21 books and numerous articles on United Organizations, International Administration, and International Criminal Tribunals. Since 1984, Ibe Beder has been a university lecturer in the field of international organizations and administrations in France, Switzerland, the United States, and Canada. Since 1995, he has lectured on the United Nations, the international criminal tribunals, including the Nuremberg trials in the United States, England, Belgium, and Hungary. Ibe Beder has acted as legal advice to international civil servants in Geneva, in their internal appeals and their applications before the ILO and the UN administrative tribunals. Ibe Beder is a member of many international associations, including Academic Council on the United Nations System, Union of International Associations, International Association for Humanitarian Medicine, Rob Christum, Association of Former International Civil Servants, and member of the Executive Committee of the Association of Former International Civil Servants for Development, Graysals. It's a pleasure to have you both with us. And now I will leave the floor to Manuela, who will provide some practical information on how this session will be developed. Manuela, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Very quickly, just as a reminder to those that are joining Great Talks for the first time, the rules of the game are very simple. We have a chat column on the right side of the screen where you can write your questions or your comments in a short sentence, if possible. I will try to moderate so far as possible the questions and comments. And please close your mics so that we can improve the sound and particularly hear Eve uh, uh, better. Thank you so much. So um, I will immediately give the floor to Professor Sands uh, because there is a great expectation uh, uh, regarding his remark, uh, not only based on the books that were mentioned by Alejandro, but particularly regarding the, the, uh, the validity, the credibility, the impact of uh, the concept of uh, crimes against humanity and genocide today, because we open the newspapers every day and we are terrorized and we wonder uh, what were the lessons and did we learn anything? Uh, from the Nuremberg experience. So the floor is your, 
uh, Professor Sands, please. Thank you very much, Manuela, and also greetings to everybody from London. Uh, I'm very pleased to join this wonderful group, and uh, I thought what I'd just do is give a few introductory remarks to set a little bit of context on um, my relationship with the concepts of crimes against humanity and genocide, uh, and the ideas that have emerged from the act of writing East West Street uh, and uh, the Rat Line. And I'm right now writing uh, a third book, which will in effect become a trilogy, um, which focuses on the arrest in uh, October 1998 of Senator Augusto Pinochet in London. People forget that he was arrested for crimes against humanity and genocide. That was the original arrest warrant issued by Judge Baltasar Garzon of Spain. So I'm a university professor and I teach in the field of international law, including international criminal law. And I also do cases as a barrister and I've done a number, I would say too many cases about crimes against humanity and genocide um, before various international courts. In 2010, I received an invitation to give a lecture on the cases that I do on crimes against humanity and genocide. Crimes Against Humanity, as you know, uh, is about the protection of the individual. Genocide is about the protection of groups. I accepted the invitation because of where it came from. The law faculty in the University of Lviv in Ukraine. And Lviv used to be Lvov when it was part of Poland in the interwar years. And before that, and a little bit after, it was Lemberg when it was part of the austro Hungarian Empire. And my grandfather happened to have been born in Lemberg in 1904. And he'd never talked to me about it. I knew him well. He lived until 1997. And we were very close. But he never talked about what had happened before 1945, his own family story. Uh, I knew he'd been through a terrible experience. I knew that he'd lost pretty much every family member he'd left behind in Lemberg, Lviv, but I didn't know the details. So in comes this invitation. And of course I accept, not because I have a burning desire to give a lecture on crimes against humanity and genocide, but because I want to know more about my grandfather. I want to know where he was born. I want to find the house. I want to find the street. It's about his identity and about mine. And I spend the summer of 2010 doing a little bit of research on crimes against humanity and genocide, which I know well as topics. What I didn't know, which I discovered accidentally that summer and then lectured about when I arrived in Lviv, was that the man who put crimes against humanity as a concept into the Nuremberg Statute in the summer of 1945 was Hirsch Lauterpacht, professor of international law at Cambridge University, and who came from Lviv and who had been a student at the law faculty. And I just thought how amazing that the inventor, if you like, of the concept of crimes against humanity in international legal terms came from the city that had invited me to give a lecture. They'll enjoy that, I thought. And then I carried on doing my research and discovered that the man who invented the concept of genocide literally wrote it out on a piece of paper formed from the Latin and Greek words genus and sido, uh, Raphael Lemkin, had also been a student at the law faculty in Lviv. And the people who invited me were also unaware of that fact. How remarkable I thought. I'm asked to give a lecture on the origins of genocide and crimes against humanity by the law faculty in the University of Lviv. And I will turn up and announce to them that they are the place of origin, which is what I did. And they were pleasantly and uh, excitedly surprised, I have to say. I hadn't expected to write a book, but I started writing a book about the three men, my grandfather, Leon Buchholz, Hirsch Lauterpacht, Raphael Lemkin. There's lots of L's in the name. Lvov, Lviv, Lemberg, Leopolis, Leon, Lauterpacht, Lemkin. Um, it sort of adds up. And then into the story came a fourth man, Hans Frank, who was uh, once the personal lawyer to Adolf Hitler uh, from 1928 to 1933. And then from 1939 
appointed by Hitler as recompense for his fine work, governor general of Nazi occupied Poland. And in August 1942, on the 1st of August 1942, Hans Frank travels from the Wawel Castle, where he has his headquarters in Krakow, and makes his way to Lemberg. And on the 1st of August 1942, in the aula of the University of Lviv, delivers a speech in which he announces the implementation of the final solution, the carrying out of crimes against humanity and genocide against the entire Jewish population of the city and its environs, as well as many others, Poles, Roma, and political uh, opponents. And so Hans Frank becomes the fourth man in the story. He is arrested in May 1945, south of uh, Bavaria, near Schlierzak, and he becomes defendant number seven in the famous Nuremberg trial. And as descendant number seven, he is indicted for, amongst other crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. And genocide at that point treated as a war crime. Remarkably, Lauterpacht and Lemkin participate in the prosecution teams, Lauterpacht for the British, Lemkin with the Germans, uh, with the Americans. And both men are involved in the prosecution of Hans Frank. Remarkably, they do not know when the trial opens on the 20th of November, 1945, that Hans Frank is the man who effectively has been charged with the murder of their entire families and my grandfather's family. So Frank becomes, if you like, the glue that links, the, the connector that links the lives of the three men and the fourth man in the story of East West Street. And so I wrote a book and I did so with a great degree of humility and deference. I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, what Eve has to say about this because remarkably, Eve was there. I've talked at length about with Eve about what it was like to be in court when Hans Frank defended himself. Um, and I will leave it to Eve to talk about that. Um, how remarkable it is to hear you always, Eve. I've listened to you on many occasions now. Every occasion is more exciting than the previous one because I always learn something new. So I immersed myself in crimes against humanity and genocide. And I came to understand that although Lauterpacht and Lemkin shared a common objective, how to harness the power of international law to protect human beings, and they did so at exactly the same time and with similar backgrounds, both were, you know, Polish Jews who had similar origins in and around Lviv, went off and did different things. Lemkin became a public prosecutor. Lauterpacht became a professor of international law at Cambridge University. And they had different ways of doing it. Lauterpacht's vision was that we must protect all human beings because they are individual sentient human beings. And his work on human rights, published in a 1945 book, The Bill of Rights of Man, the first major treatise on the idea of international human rights law, became the basis in the summer of 45 for the ideas that he shared with Robert Jackson to protect individual human beings through the concept of crimes against humanity. There is a relationship between human rights and crimes against humanity. Lemkin had a very different vision. Lemkin's view was that human beings are attacked, targeted, mistreated, and killed, not because of what they have done, not because of their individual acts, but because they happen to be a member of a group that is hated at a particular moment in time. And so Lemkin adopted a different approach, the same ends, but a different means. Let's protect human beings because they are a member of a group. Let us protect certain groups groups by reason of nationality, religion, and race in Lemkin's conception. And in that way, we will protect individual human beings. So both men had revolutionary ideas, using the force of international law to say that the sovereignty of the state was not absolute, they could not harm individuals, and they could not harm groups. Lauterpacht was resolutely against the concept of genocide. 
he worried the crime of genocide as Lemkin had conceived of it would replace the tyranny of the state with the tyranny of the group. And to a large extent, I think he's been right. My own experience in litigating cases about genocide with the need to prove the intention to destroy a group in whole or in part has taught me that the concept tends to reinforce intergroup hatreds. It tends to reinforce the sense of otherness. It's interestingly, as I included it in the book, um, East West Street, a wonderful letter that Lemkin received from a friend of his, a political scientist, who was also an immigrant refugee who'd made his way to Wales, Aberystwyth with university, Leopold Kaur, K-O-H-R, attacked Lemkin for his book, Axis Rule, on the basis that he adopted, in effect, a Hitlerian path to protecting human beings, one which focused on matters of biological identity, and he didn't like that. My own view is that I am intellectually much more drawn to Lauterpach's idea that all individual human beings have minimum rights and should be protected because they are individual human beings. It matters not who they are, what they are, what they say, what they do, their nationality, religion, politics, sexual orientation, or anything else. The fact we are human beings entitles us to dignity and minimum protections. But I have to say, and the book is a journey in my own sense of imagination and consciousness, that I end the book with a nod to Lemkin. I find myself at a mass grave just outside Lviv, three and a half thousand human beings still residing there today. My grandfather's family and Hirsch Lauterpach's family uh, killed on a single day in 1943, the 25th of March, because they happened to be the member of the one group. My concern with the concept of genocide is that it tends to reinforce the sense of group identity, but that is of course also its strength. Uh, I've been involved in a number of more recent cases, including the Yazidi case uh, in um, Northern Iraq uh, and Syria. And in that context, I've come to understand that the crime of genocide uh, gives individual victims a different kind of hope. The hope that the fact that they are a member of a group is recognized as legitimate, which crimes against humanity does not do. And what I've come to understand is that the tension between crimes against humanity and genocide really goes to the very core of human identity and human existence. Every single one of us on this call today understands what it means to be an individual and what it means to be a member of one or more groups. And every single one of us, in a sense of our own sense of identity, has that struggle. Who am I really? How do I define myself as an individual or as a member of a group? And if so, which groups? The football team I support, the religion I happen to be born into, the country I happen to be a national of, and so on and so forth. And this is, I think, the reason why East West Street has sold much more than I expected it ever to do so and has been translated now into nearly 30 languages, because it raises a universal issue that goes to the human condition. Sure, it's about Poles and Germans and Jews and Ukrainians and Russians, but it actually goes much more broadly. I've given events all over the world that address this struggle between crimes against humanity and genocide. Of course, as many of you will know, and, and no one knows this better than Yves Begbeder, in the end, the judgment at Nuremberg didn't even mention the concept of genocide. Lauterpacht described it as the saddest day of his life, saddest even than the day he learned of the death of his parents. But he had the final word in a certain sense. After the Nuremberg judgment in October, 1946, he fought his corner, he went to the new United Nations, he lobbied, he harried, he drafted, and he got adopted the first ever multilateral human rights treaty, the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide in December, 1948, adopted on the uh, same day as the resolution of the UN General Assembly, adopting the Universal Declaration on Human Rights on which Lauterpacht had expended so much energy 
with his ideas. So you've got these two issues in conflict and intention. Over time, it is clear that genocide has emerged as in the eyes of many, but not mine, the crime of crimes. To my mind, uh, killing 100,000 people as a crime against humanity is no less terrible a thing than killing 100,000 people as a crime of genocide. And the uh, struggle between the two concepts has thrown up many problematic aspects. For example, I serve on an advisory committee for the United Kingdom Holocaust Day Memorial Trust. And at one of our away day meetings, I asked uh, in the UK, Holocaust Memorial Day commemorates not only the murder of the Jews in the Shoah, but also other analogous uh, acts of mass killing. And I asked rather innocently, how do you choose which other acts of mass murder you commemorate? And they said, well, we've got a formula given to us by the Foreign Office, although they're now revisiting it, I have to say, on the basis of my intervention and this conversation. Um, we commemorate other acts if they occurred after 1945, and if they have been characterized by an international court as a crime of genocide. Got it, I said. So does that mean, seeking clarification, you will mark the murder of 8,000 Bosnian Muslims at Srebrenica, but you will pass in silence on the killing of a, a million or more individuals in the Democratic Republic of Congo in roughly the same period. Correct. And I said, well, what's the social utility of that? Why do we put some people on a pedestal and leave others in uh, silence? And of course, there is no good answer to that. Um, genocide is not worse than crimes against humanity. It's not a numbers game. It's not only an intention game. And so what I put on the table for our conversation now uh, is um, th that issue. Why is it? that when a president of the United States says that a genocide is happening in so-and-so country, it's on the front page of every newspaper of the world. But if an American president said a crime against humanity is happening, it doesn't get picked up at all. Or if it does, it's on page 23 of the newspapers. How has this happened? What are the consequences? And what should be done about it? With that, let me stop. The second book, Ratline, takes the story forward in relation to Vechter's, uh, Frank's deputy, Otto Vechter, but I can talk more about that perhaps during questions or just pass uh, until another occasion. Let me stop and let us hear from the main man. Uh, remarkably, Yves Begbeder was there at the Nuremberg trial. And it is a great honor and a happiness, Eve, once more to be with you. Thank you very much, Professor Sanz. And yes, indeed, since we have Eve on the screen also, and I hope he can hear well uh, what we are saying, I will give immediately the floor to Eve to comment on what you just explained on the clash, as you said, between the two concepts, the genocides and crimes against humanity, but particularly also your comments uh, regarding uh, the utilization of these two concepts uh, here, but not there in the current uh, international system and politics. Eve, you have the floor, please. I think it's, you're muted, Eve, but you're it's, okay It's now. okay, it's open uh, now. Well, yeah. to join you, I'm happy. I'm happy and I'm very honored to be uh, able to have this talk together with Philip Sands. Uh, uh, I'd like to ask a minor, perhaps a minor or anecdotal question uh, about the last two books of Philip. Uh, he's referring to a second generation of the criminals. In other words, uh, Hans Funk's son, who hates his father, and on the, in the second book, the uh, uh, excuse me, Otto Weichmeister's son, who loves his father and, and keeps his love in spite of all the evidence uh, concerning the crimes committed by him. Uh, I understand that this uh, interesting approach is it uh, based on the fact that you wanted to know a bit more about the family of those criminals? Professor, 
Professor Sands, do you want to comment to reply on that? Why these friendships? Sure. Um, I carry out, thank you, Eve. Um, I carry out my research rather like um, when I uh, litigate a case, I try to leave no stone unturned. And I have the great happiness of being able to work with a number of wonderful young doctoral students and research assistants. And I asked them to find everything they could about Hans Frank while I was writing East West Street. And I came across a book, a rather wonderful uh, and shocking book by Nicholas Frank, the son of Hans Frank, who describes with a bitterness how much he despises his father. He calls him a criminal. The first time I met Nick, he said to me, I'm against the death penalty in all cases, except in the case of my father. And we came to know each other well, and we are in very close contact. He's become a very good friend. One day he said to me, this was in about 2011, you're interested in Lemberg Lviv. Would you like to meet the governor of, the son of the governor of Lemberg Lviv? He was my father's deputy, Otto Wächter, and he has a son called Horst. And uh, you will like Horst, he said. He's a nice man, but he has different views from me on his father. He looks for the good in his father. And uh, I said, fine, let's meet up. We did meet up and Nicholas was right. Um, he stands in complete opposite to Nicholas. He looks for the good in his father. Uh, he's not a Holocaust denier. He's not a racist. He's not an anti-Semite. His view is, as a son who loved his mother and whose mother loved her husband, it is his filial duty as a son to find the good in his father. And he does this taking things to, I would say, a particular extreme that is really a denial of the facts. And so my relationship with Nicholas and Horst has lasted now 10 years. I am much closer to Nicholas. Uh, Nicholas and Horst no longer speak to each other uh, as a consequence of various things that happened that I describe in the book. We made a film together, which you may be interested in seeing. It's available on Amazon and Apple Films and so on and so forth. It's called My Lazi Legacy, and it explores the relationship between the three of us as we travel to Ukraine, to the killing fields and other places. It's a very complex situation. And I think Horst and Nicholas um, incarnate different ways of dealing with the terrible past. Until I got to know Nicholas and Horst well, I really hadn't devoted much time to imagining what it means to have a parent who is a mass murderer. Um, it's a very big burden. But of course, they bear that burden differently. Nicholas has a father who was tried, convicted, and hanged at Nuremberg. Horst, on the other hand, has a father who was indicted for mass murder, genocide, crimes against humanity, but who escaped and was never tried. And on Horst's view, he died, his father, an innocent man. And the gap between those two situations and those two perspectives is what I explore in the two books. Uh, may I ask a more general question on the effect of international criminal tribunals on international criminal law? Uh, if, we, if we go back to Nuremberg, Tokyo, then the temporary tribunal, uh, criminal tribunals for ex Yugoslavia, Rwanda, uh, Sierra Leone, and uh, the creation of the International Criminal Court, which has already started uh, having activities. Would you say that uh, these uh, tribunals have had an effect, let's say, on three different uh, aspects. The first aspect on norms, and I think this is very, very clear, and that especially Nuremberg uh, had a profound effect on the norms applying to this field. Secondly, uh, prevention. Would this, these uh, tribunals have any, were expected or not to, to uh, to prevent further crimes, genocides. And, and the third, uh, third field is punishment, where obviously those uh, active tribunals have had a direct effect on the 
Nürnberg bei der Desperate or Time Sentence and uh, the, the others on the uh, uh, so my, my, it's it's a bit, rather big pressure. I don't know what uh, whether, whether it's possible to to reply in in five minutes. But uh, uh, any uh, in in effect, is, uh, is there any progress in in the fight against impunity, and is it due to those tribunals in, in small or, or large aspects? Thank you. Professor Sands, yeah. please, yes. Yeah, let me let me just say, 1945 and Nuremberg was a revolutionary moment. Until 1945, the position in international law broadly was that a state could do whatever it wished to its nationals. If a state wanted to adopt a rule which said every person over the age of 50 will be executed over the next month, international law had nothing to say about that the state could do as it wished. And through the ideas of crimes against humanity and genocide, and of course, human rights, which had been incorporated into the United Nations Charter, all of a sudden, everything changed. States were subject to new limits. And that change has had profoundly significant consequences. You can trace <laughs> the totality of our modern system of international rights and justice to that 1945 moment, the UN Charter and Nuremberg and various other developments around that time and which followed. It was an absolutely revolutionary moment. But of course, with very limited exceptions, Eve is one of them, thankfully, the voice from that generation is slowly being extinguished. And people who understood why those developments were made in 1945 are fewer and fewer to remind us how fragile our existence is and how terrible can be the actions of governments and individuals in certain cases. So the 1945 moment was revolutionary and it also had a preventive instinct. Has it prevented further harm? That's a really complex question. I think that we are still in an era of transformation of values. Um, I remember back in the 1980s, I was a young academic teaching at Cambridge, researching at Cambridge, and I had a wonderful colleague at St. Catherine's College, Sir John Baker, professor of English legal history, and about once a month he'd invite me for lunch and he'd ask me what I was working on in international law, and I'd tell him, and he'd say, ah, yes, Philippe, um, I think we had a similar problem in English law in about 1472, and it took 268 years to sort it out. And that's where we are, I think, in the international law on prevention. Uh, it's early days, it's a long game, it's a long narrative arc, but it's not a useless one. Uh, a year and a half ago, I found myself in Washington, DC. I was doing a seminar at George Washington University with Professor Thomas Bergenthal, a friend and a wonderful jurist. He had been in Auschwitz in 1944 in the charge of one Joseph Mengele. And I was about to go and do a hearing at the International Court of Justice for the Gambia against Myanmar on the mistreatment of the Rohingya community. And he said to me, Philippe, can you imagine how extraordinary it would have been in 1944 if there had been a country, small African country or any other country that could have gone to some international court with a claim that the mistreatment of me and the others in Mengele's charge violated basic norms of international law. And that's the change that's happened. Whether it has prevented, there has been a little bit of punishment that we know, but not a lot. It's the world is a better place for having these standards adopted. But the questions you ask are very complex questions. Eve, and I think it's a long game and it will take many years, decades, centuries even to know what the transformative effect of these norms is going to be. Uh, 
Eve, do you agree with that? Yeah, when, when, my, when I was teaching and my students asked me, I said it's going to take 200 or 200 years before we get anything uh, more con con concrete or, or when the International Criminal Court uh, starts having uh, results or, or e efficiency. Now I have a, maybe a, it's a, not really a question, but uh, in, in uh, reading the, your last book on uh, La Filière, uh, uh, I, I was uh, struck by the fact that you, you just mentioned that uh, Vesta was never uh, arrested for his crimes, never judged, and never sentenced. Uh, in in uh, contrast with Nuremberg, where all the uh, uh, all those accused were in the dock and ready to be to be to be judged. So, so uh, this is one of the pro problems of the International Criminal Court, which has no power of uh, arrest and uh, not too much uh, cooperation from many countries and strong opposition of uh, some, such as the USA, USSR, no, not, well, Russia, uh, and others. So it's going to take a long time before its mandate is accepted by major countries. And even Sudan, as, 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 as we know, is uh, the head of state who's been arrested in his own country but has not been delivered, I don't know if it's changed today, has not been delivered to the International Criminal Court. So uh, this is a, a major, major problem of uh, uh, having uh, available uh, uh, arrest and uh, proper, proper judgment. But one, one thing I wanted to mention, yes, in, uh, in, your, in, your, in your last book, the. Uh, the, the fact that uh, Vest has never been arrested, and uh, the, uh, the, the description, your description of the escape route for for those uh, high-level uh, uh, Nazi criminals, and possibly with the assistance, with, well, with the assistance of uh, the Vatican, and the assistance perhaps of the International Red Cross. Would you like to comment on that? How how come this was? made easy for, for those uh, archery uh, criminals. Well, one of the things that was a big surprise in writing the rat line, and I was able to uh, write something that I think was original in terms of the material available to me, was that in the course of the meetings and conversations with Nicholas Frank and Horst Wächter, Horst gave me access to or copies of the entire um, file uh, archive of his parents, letters, diaries, photographs, and so on and so forth. So I, with the support of a number of extraordinary research assistants, it was all in German, it was very time consuming, was able to uh, go through the material, which is really divided in two periods, up to the 9th of May, 1945, when the war came to an end, uh, and post 9th of May 1945, Vesta had been indicted, but he escaped. And we now have, with this material, the capacity to work out what happened to him between the moment the war ended and his effort to get to Argentina, South America, and his arrival in Rome, hoping to get on the rack line, the Reich migratory route taken by Eichmann and Mengele and Priebke and many others. And built into the material, the letters, the diaries, often in coded form because Otto and his wife, Charlotte Wächter, and I should say incidentally, Charlotte is the beating heart of the book, in my view. Um, they write in code because they don't want people to know who they're meeting. And that's why it took four years to decode all of the letters. We worked it out completely. And one of the big surprises was that what emerged was that Otto Wächter had been assisted, if not by the Vatican as an organization, by a very senior bishop uh, who was um, called Alois Hudal, an Austrian bishop who had helped many others to escape. 
and he is described only in Otto Wächter's letters to Charlotte as the religious gentleman. I don't know, and we won't know until the Vatican archive is fully researched, to what extent he was assisted by his old friend, uh, Pius XII, or whether he was just off on a frolic of his own. And, you know, I'm, as, as a lawyer and as an academic, I have to be scrupulous and careful and, and clear. Um, I'm very careful. I don't ever say that Wächter was helped by the Vatican. I do say that he was helped by an individual who was high up in the Vatican, in fact, more than one. And you will all appreciate there is a very important distinction um, between uh, the two statements. So we do know that some senior Vatican officials after 1947 were employed as secret agents by the United States. They were paid $50 a month in cash to report on certain individuals that they came across. And we also know uh, that um, Alois Hudal was one of those secret agents. Now, this was a real shock for me, I have to say. The other senior Vatican official who was a secret agent working for the Americans for five years, $50 a month in cash for five years, was a cardinal who was Pius XII's chief press spokesperson. And of course, that raises a fundamental question. Was the cardinal off on a frolic or was he there with the knowledge and support of his boss, Pius XII? I don't know the answer to that question. And a lot will turn on it when others find out the answer to that question. It is clear that those two individuals provided information on Wächter from the moment he arrived in Rome. He arrived in the late morning of the 29th of April, 1949, and we have established to 100% certainty that within 24 hours, the man who met him, Bishop Alois Hudal, had reported his arrival, his uh, fake identity, Alfredo Reinhardt, and his place of residence to the Americans, to one Thomas Lucid, who ran the anti-Soviet spy network uh, for the United States Counterintelligence Corps. In other words, the Americans knew that the man they had indicted for mass murder had arrived in Rome, and for three months, they did nothing to apprehend him. Rather, it appears that they used him to fight the new struggle, which was against the Soviets, the Bolsheviks, the Reds. And this, of course, raised some fundamental questions. And Eve, you're aware, uh, sadly, I have lost him recently as my dear neighbor and good friend for more than 20 years, the spy writer John Le Carre. I'm not an expert uh, on espionage. Uh, and my practice when I encounter things that I don't know about is to go to people who do know about them and ask them what on earth is going on. So I called him up and I said, uh, I've, got, I've come across this perplexing story of a senior Nazi who seems to have run into an American run spy ring and he was indicted, but they didn't do anything about it. Um, indicted for mass murder, one of the greatest mass murders of the 20th century. And the Americans and the British just observed him apparently and didn't do anything. What was going on? Le Carre said, come over, bring a few cakes. Let's have a cup of tea and send me some documents in advance. I'll look into it. I arrived and he surprised me. He said, uh, huh, this really interests me. I'm gonna surprise you, Philippe. I was there when this happened. I said, what do you mean you were there? He said, I was an 18 year old soldier in the British army. I spoke German, so my job was to interrogate German uh, soldiers and others who were in displaced person camps and prisoner of war camps, and to find the ones who were of interest to us. I said, what, of interest, so you could prosecute them? He said, no, so we could recruit them. And that, he said, was deeply distressing. He had grown up in Britain during the war, to believe that Nazis were the worst of the worst. And now here he was as an 18 year old in his first job, recruiting the worst of the worst, as he put it to our side against the new enemy. And I think that the style of his writing, matters of duplicity and double dealings and dishonesty and things not being where they seem, not being exactly what they seem, he dates to that first 
encounter he had as an 18 year old with the rat line and with the world of Italy and Austria and the Cold War struggle between East and West. So I learned a great deal that surprised me and frankly, Eve, dear Eve, that absolutely horrified me uh, in terms of what the West did and did not do in 1949 in the Cold War period. Thank you very much. And I have another, uh, well, you didn't answer the question about the internet. As we are in Geneva, theoretically, uh, we'd certainly be very interested to know if you found anything about the International Red Cross helping those Nazi to escape, which would be rather surprising too. Yeah, I don't know if that requires a response from me or whether we should use the time to open it up to uh, to some any any conversations or questions I've seen on the chat. There are there are one or two comments. As you prefer, Professor Sands, but uh, yes, anyway, to follow up also on your last comment uh, regarding the uh, the utilization by certain governments in certain circumstances of both concepts. Uh, genocide and crimes of, against humanity and uh, as shown by your examples. The two questions are more or less related to the current uh, recent uh, utilization of uh, both the concepts. David Dror is asking, uh, would you agree to comment on the proposition that today we see expressions of excessive interpretations of human rights to include their ability to murder other individuals or act in various anti-community manners, while uh, Cecile is uh, um, commenting and asking regarding the very well known in, by the public opinion of uh, genocide because of the episode, the tragedy of the Shoah, as opposed to the concept of crimes against humanity, which is not as well known as the other one, as genocide. I don't know if you want to take both comments, both questions oh. together. Sure. As you prefer. Well, they're both huge, huge and wonderful questions. And how long have you got? Are you all available for the next eight hours to uh, have a lengthy discursus on uh, matters that go to the heart of uh, the modern system of international law? I suspect you're not. Uh, I'm no, not, as, I'm afraid. As you wish. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I think just dealing with the second question, first Cecile's question, I, I mean, I've, oft, I've thought a lot about what is it, why is it that genocide excites us more than crimes against humanity? I, I've sort of come to the conclusion that, that it's, a, well, it's a complex question, but I think it's in part the magic of the word. Crimes against humanity has a sort of technical aspect that seems legalistic and does not open up the imagination, whereas Lemkin's word it's an extraordinary word and it causes us somehow to imagine gruesomeness and awfulness. Curiously, and many people do not appreciate this, although Nuremberg was in, uh, although genocide was in the Nuremberg indictment as a war crime and was argued during the hearings, at the end of the day, the judges made no mention of the word genocide in the famous Nuremberg judgment. You can read the entirety of the judgment or you can search it. If you've got a PDF text, you will not find the word genocide raised. This was, as I understand it, a consequence of the American objection to genocide as a concept, fearful that if given legs in the Nuremberg judgment, it would be used against the United States by blacks or African-Americans or the American indigenous community for things that had happened 200 years earlier or even more uh, recently. So the Americans were firmly opposed to the concept and it did not take off in the judgment. It only took off in 1948 when the convention uh, was uh, adopted. Although a number of national courts, including Polish national courts, um, did uh, use it. Um, Another aspect of it is that we have a 1948 convention on the prevention and punishment of genocide. There's no equivalent convention on the prevention and punishment of crimes against humanity. And that has left a gap 
which I think is an unfortunate gap. There is now a draft convention prepared by the United Nations International Law Commission, which of course meets annually in Geneva, and was concluded, the special rapporteurs, my former student and dear friend, Sean Murphy, the American member of the International Law Commission, but states have not supported it. And in particular, it's extremely distressing that the countries that led the charge in 1945, Britain and the United States, which have largely turned their back on the 1945 settlement, certainly under the administrations of Trump and Johnson. I think it's changed a little bit under Biden, but uh, uh, let's see how much. Um, uh, are no longer there to bat for these kinds of values. And I think that leaves a, a very big gap. How remarkable, looking back on 1945, that if I'm to be asked, which is the country I rely on the most uh, to carry the flag or the flame of liberal democracy and the idea of the rule of law in international relations, it is the country of nationality of many of the defendants at Nuremberg. It is Germany. It is not Britain. It is not the United States. And that is, I think, a remarkable development over the last 75 years. Um, um, David, Mark, in relation to your questions, I mean, we know the concept of human rights has been weaponized in all sorts of directions uh, in the past um, 15 years in particular. In many places, it's now a dirty word or a dirty pair of words. Um, and there's a lot of re-evaluation uh, that is going on. Have there been abuses of arguments about human rights? No doubt um, there have been. Of course, we're now told that corporations have human rights. And I wonder what the utility of, of that um, has uh, been. Um, but I, I think your question is so large that I can't begin um, to uh, explore it. Yes, there have been uh, excessive interpretations of notions uh, of human rights in certain contexts. Uh, but equally, the fact remains that there are many, most, if not all governments around the world, that when it suits them, will not respect the human rights of others. I have this right now in relation to one of my cases to which I'm most attached, the case of Chagos, the British Indian Ocean Territory, and the forcible removal of 2,000 human beings, Black human beings, descendants of enslaved people from a British colony uh, between 1968 and 1973, we have obtained a judgment of the International Court of Justice, an advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice, a ruling that this removal was unlawful. They are entitled to go back and the British government is simply refusing to honor uh, the advisory opinion. It is extremely distressing that uh, one of my own countries is now adopting this position. Thank you very much, Professor Sands. Uh, I wonder if uh, Eve or anybody on the screen has other questions or other comments. Uh, uh, I have uh, one question. Uh, yes, Eve, please. A uh, question of norms. Uh, there are talks about uh, including uh, violations of uh, environmental law into the mandate of the International Court, uh, Criminal Court. Do, do you know about that? So are you in favor of uh, including such uh, a field of action? Well, I mean, as you know, the International Criminal Court's role is to apply, you know this better than anyone, Eve, rules of international criminal law. But very often there is an overlap. Um, there are concentric circles that overlap crimes against humanity and sort of international crimes on the one hand and human rights norms on the other. Every violation of, of an international criminal law is also going to give rise to a violation of a human rights standard. Not every violation of human rights standard will give rise to a violation of an international criminal law standard. But there is a, a living, breathing relationship between the two concepts. One informs and touches the other, but they are not identical. And the International Criminal Court is not a court of human rights. It applies international criminal law. And so that limits, if you like, the writ of um, international human rights law. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? 
I would like, as far as I'm concerned, uh, ask a question or it's rather a comment, I don't know, but it's to go back to the title, the subtitle of this great talk, Did We Learn Something? Uh, you said that we need at least 200 years or more to really assess if there is an impact and what is the impact of the, of the rules of international law progress in this area. But uh, how do you see the future? Do you think that really in the next, uh, I don't know, 100 years maybe, we will see uh, less and less uh, crimes against humanities and genocides? And then there is John Burley who is asking right now two rather direct questions. First, what did the Soviets really do in Nuremberg? Uh, regarding your recent book and were the Soviet silent partners, was Victor's justice good enough to protect the Soviets at that time? And secondly, on another matter, what is your assistant? What is your assistant on the future? Yeah, what is your assessment, I guess, on well, the future of the International Criminal Court, which well, is exactly what I had in mind. Yes, please, Professor Sands. Well, uh, you know, I am by disposition an optimistic human being. Um, I'm, I think we're in a very difficult moment right now, I think, and I think it's going to get more difficult in the near future. I think the rise of xenophobia, nationalism, populism, not least in the United Kingdom and the United States, but in so many other countries, there's no question that it's on the rise. And there's no question that people are feeling disconnected in many parts of the world with decision making. And I worry that the lessons of 19... The 1930s are not being fully um, recalled. Um, I don't think it's identical. I think things are different. I think we have different structures in place, but we can see things happen that are in certain ways familiar uh, with what has come before. But I think the history of international law is that when disaster befalls, the rebuilding always starts on the foundations that pre-existed the moment of disaster. And so I think that whatever difficulties we are in and however difficult it may yet get, over the longer run, we will build on what we have now. Human rights will not disappear, international criminal law will not disappear, but they face tough challenges right now. As for the International Criminal Court, I think it's in a very, very difficult place. Um, it's obviously not had an easy or, or successful first 20 years of existence. Um, there are many complex reasons for that. Uh, I um, hope that it can repair itself. I've even on occasion asked myself the question, did we create an international criminal court uh, too soon? I, I, I don't know what the answer to that question is. Um, there is a new prosecutor, there are some new judges. It's a really tough moment, and um, I I don't know what way the International Criminal Court will go. It's it's a really long haul. Thank you. Maybe you would like to say something about John's question on the Soviets, uh, silent partners, or Victor's justice at uh, Nuremberg. No, the Soviets played a very very big role. I'd refer you to a wonderful book, new book, recently published last year by Francine Hirsch, H-I-R-S-C-H, which sets out in very great detail the role played by the Soviet judges, the Soviet prosecutors, um, and, and others. So they were not the silent partners. They played a very um, significant role. Uh, yes, there was an element of Victor's justice at Nuremberg, but it didn't only protect the Soviets, it protected the British and the Americans also in relation to certain elements. And one of the legacies of Nuremberg, I think, is this sense of lopsided justice, that international criminal law is essentially for the strong against the weak. I mean, just to, without putting too fine a point on it, if you leave this webinar and go onto the statute of the International Criminal Court after we've finished, and look at the individuals who've been indicted, you will find 46, well, 45 men and one woman, I think it is, Every single one of them is black. Okay, Black people do not have a monopoly on international criminality. What has gone wrong in our system that our international criminal court has focused exclusively on a single category of human beings by reference to the skin color that they happen to have? 
this troubles me greatly. Um, and I think this is something we really, really need to address. If you're interested in this more, I did a BBC radio programme, which is you can listen to on BBC Sounds. It's called The Nuremberg Legacy. And I interviewed amongst others. Well, Eve is on it and various other two other participants from 1945-46 are on it. What a privilege to speak to them. Eve and the marvellous Benjamin Ferenc, uh, ever youthful at 101 uh, Eve, there's a role model for you. Um, and the wonderful Robbie Dundas, who was the daughter of the presiding judge, who went to interview Yodel and Keitel in their prison cells because she worked at Bletchley and then sat in on the proceedings. But I also spoke to Karim Khan, the new prosecutor for the broadcast, and you can hear his voice defending the court from that charge. But I think there is a problem. There is a problem. Professor Sands, I know you have to leave to another event. I have two questions on my screen, one related to the role of President Clinton in the Rwanda genocide and another one on the role of technology, medias and social media regarding crimes yeah. against humanity and genocide. I don't know if you have time to yes, address let's, quickly. Let's take, let's take those two questions. Um, I mean, Rwanda is complex. I think a lot of people at the UN, in the US, um, France, one might mention, um, and other countries had very grave anxiety, should we say, about what happened in Rwanda. How was it that in 1993 we were not able to prevent a million people from being killed? It seems extraordinary, but we didn't. And the creation of the Rwanda Tribunal was a response to that. Um, how can we avoid it again? Well, it's about, you know, the social side of human beings, uh, community organizations and governments speaking out. I'm very proud to be part of the legal team of the Gambia against Myanmar in relation to the mistreatment of the Rohingya. Um, and I think that that is an indication that some countries are willing to go to protect, go to international courts to protect uh, others. So we have, we have the embryonic structures to enable us to stop these things from happening. But as with the Rohingya, so with the Yazidis and so with the Uyghurs, whether we call it a crime against humanity or genocide, and different views have been expressed. Um, there is obviously something that is very bad uh, that, is, that is going on. So we just have to redouble our efforts. But we have the element structures now that we didn't have in 1945. Uh, and we have treaties. And that's, that's very significant. Um, social media, hugely important. Um, right now in the Rohingya case, we're taking steps to get hold of the deleted Facebook entries from various people in the in Myanmar, um, Tat Mador, the army, to ascertain the messages they were sending out. Um, social media is both uh, an instrumentality of incitement. We know that. Uh, it goes beyond radio and television and other forms. Uh, but it's also and instrumentality of warning. Uh, and so I think that our sense of it is mixed. Um, it offers challenges as well as opportunities. I think we're only beginning to understand um, the complexities of social media in making information available whilst at the same time encouraging hate. This is very complex. Thank you very much, Professor Sanz. Uh, before I give the floor to Alejandro to the conclusion to, for this great talk, I would like just to flag to you and to everybody that on the 8th of December, we have a Yazidi refugee a victim uh, herself and her family of the genocides of the Yazidis in Iraq. And she's now a researcher on the perceptions of uh, refugees uh, here in Switzerland. So I, of course, I would like to invite you insofar as your agenda allows that it will be on the 8th of December, uh, again, at the same time on Great Talk on Zoom. Uh, and well, the floor is yours, Alejandro, to conclude this great, great talk. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you very much, Manena, and thank you very much, Professor Sanz and Yves Begbeder. It's as fascinating hearing you as, as reading you. And of course, we would like to spend six or eight hours, as you mentioned, but we could do that in different great talks that we could arrange in the future. So please, I hope we will be connected. And you really 
walked us from your family research, from your grandparent to universal concepts uh, for individual to the group. And uh, of course, we acknowledge that how fragile our existence is. And uh, I was uh, a little bit troubled that you, you mentioned, of course, and you remind us that we are in the early days of uh, prevention in, and in very difficult times, but uh, you gave us also hope. But the people like you and people like Ips are, are working on this, and then we will the lessons will not be forgotten. So thank you very much again. Uh, I know you have uh, to join another session. We thank you, Eve, very much again. It's always fascinating to, to hear you. I'm sorry for the technological problems we had to, to go through to, to link you. And thank you uh, again to all the participants. We will uh, share this uh, talk in our gray channel in YouTube and in our website. So thank you very much. Thank you very much again, Professor Saad. Thank you very much, Eve. And good evening to all of you. Bye.